Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this session on Uniting for Action, Operationalizing the Global Diabetes Compact to Improve Access to Care for People Living with Diabetes. We'll just give it a minute before uh, to let people join in. Thank you for your patience. Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for the session on Uniting for Action, Operationalizing Global Diabetes Compact to Improve Access to Care for People Living with Diabetes. I'm Noel and I will be a technical facilitator today. For assistance, please use the chat function to message anyone with the title technical facilitator in their name. Before we get started, I have a few technical notes to explain. If you would like to contribute a perspective, idea, or thought, please use the chat function. If you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A button. You can find both of these features at the bottom of your Zoom window. Please note that this session will be recorded for documentation purposes. We are also streaming live on Facebook to enable a larger audience to take part in the discussion. For those of you just joining us, thank you for attending this session on Uniting for Action, Operationalizing the Global Diabetes Compact to Improve Access to Care for People Living with Diabetes. I will now pass the floor to Dr. Peter, Special Advisor to the Director General of the World Health Organization. Dr. Dr. Peter, the floor is yours. Thank you very much and good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everybody. It's my pleasure to be your moderator today. I just want to say a quick word of welcome to everyone around the world. It's particularly humbling and meaningful for me to be moderating this session. Almost uh, uh, 30 years ago, I was an intern on the same wards where the first patients received insulin for diabetes at the Toronto General Hospital in Toronto, Canada. And so I felt a special connection to this uh, 100th anniversary of, uh, of uh, that event um, in uh, this year. You know, uh, over the past couple of years, the world's gone through maybe the worst global crisis in, uh, in about 100 years, and that's COVID. And uh, it seems that uh, COVID now is turning into a, a two-track uh, or tale of two worlds type of pandemic with rates falling in many high income countries and, and still rising in many low income countries as a result of vaccine inequity. Um, once we uh, start to recover as a world and we're not there yet, the issue will be recovering back to the sustainable development goals. Uh, even though only one of those measures really is about NCDs, uh, the NCDs account for about 70% of deaths and diabetes is a very prominent issue among non-communicable diseases. And so what we're dealing with here is a public health problem of a very, very large magnitude that's very relevant to the recovery from COVID. And so our focus on the Global Diabetes Compact, on making sure it's well implemented, on improving access to care, for people living with diabetes because there is not uh, across the board access to care for people living with diabetes. Um, unfortunately at the moment uh, is a very important topic and only by working together can we achieve it. So I wanna welcome everybody to this webinar and I wanna start with, uh, we have a great array of speakers and I want us to start by hearing from Professor Nadi Balde who's the vice president and immediate past Africa regional chair of the International Diabetes Federation. Uh, Nadi, you have the floor and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, uh, Dr. Peter. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning. On behalf of the International Diabetes Federation, I am happy and honored to give a scene sitting introduction in this virtual event on how to explore the next steps after launching the WHO Global Diabetes Compact. Let me provide uh, some context to start with. Uh, next slide, please. In uh, 2019, IDF estimated that 463 million adults lived with diabetes three times more than in 2000. This fast growth shows how the epidemic is out of control. 
This is not a problem of affluent society. 79% of people with diabetes live now in low and middle countries. Over 1.1 million children and adolescents live with type one diabetes. In addition, 374 million adults have impaired glucose tolerance and are at a high risk of developing type two diabetes. But half of the people living with diabetes are not diagnosed. Lack of diagnosis and treatment can lead to a number of complications and death. Diabetes-related mortality has increased by 70% since 2000. Uh, 4 million in 2019. IDF estimates the number of diabetes cases will continue to rise, putting a heavy burden on individuals, families, and societies. All diabetes indicators are worsening. Next slide, please. But despite the situation, government are not responding has recurred. The fund dedicated to diabetes care and type 2 diabetes prevention are insufficient. Diabetes awareness is still lacking in many countries where many misconceptions about the condition remain. The diabetes training of healthcare professional is often deficient. Access to diabetes care is still a challenge for millions. Next slide. In 2021 and 2022, we celebrate the centenary of insulin. On January 23, 2022, it will be the 100 years since the first successful use of therapeutic insulin. We have seen two major political developments this year, the launch of WHO Global Diabetes Compact and the adoption of the WHO Resolution on Diabetes. These initiatives are key to change the current situation and drive action by improving type 2 prevention and ensuring timely diagnosis and access to effective and quality products, including insulin. The insulin centenary is the moment to act. If not now, when? In this key moment, the International Diabetes Federation stands ready to support WHO and member states to improve the lives of people living with diabetes worldwide. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Nadi Balde, for those excellent introductory comments. And it's now my pleasure to introduce my colleague, uh, Dr. Bente Mickelson, who's the director of the Department for Non-Communicable Diseases at the World Health Organization, who will tell us about this very, very important uh, global compact and the uh, the Global Diabetes Compact and about the last World Health Assembly where it was discussed. Bente, thank you so much for joining us and you have the floor. Thank you, Peter. And uh, thank, thank you to all the organizers. This is excellent and it's a true sign of partnership. So I will go through very quickly and uh, you will all get access to the slides because it's like uh, sort of where are we and what, what is the next step. So I think what we are seeing today through this meeting is both a need but also a real starting point for uniting for action. And we are now about to operationalize the compact that we pre-launched on the World Diabetes Day last year and uh, through the summit that was al already mentioned by Peter. Next slide, please. And next slide, please. So I would like to use uh, the words of Dr. Tedros. So uh, when he uh, finalized his speech on the item of NCD, he was especially speaking to the Global Diabetes Compacts. And he said that this will boost the WHO work to prevent risk factors for diabetes and bring diabetes treatment and care to all who need it. And I think the fact that has already mentioned that is 100 years since discovery of insulin and only 50% of the type 2 diabetes patients can actually access on a regular basis, 100 years. We are talking about an innovation without a real implementation. And he says, we know to, uh, the concern of many member states and the need to foc focus on access to insulin through pre-qualification. I will come back to that. He thanked the government of Canada to co-host. And then the next slide, 
He also uh, thanked the Russian Federation because they were chairing the resolution, which is really a watershed resolution on diabetes and uh, requesting then um, uh, diabetes to be part of course, uh, as the NCD part of the UHC uh, and also to develop recommendations, both to strengthen diabetes responses, including of course prevention, but also the member states were very, very carefully including uh, prevention and management on obesity. Next slide. So it was a cause for celebration and the journey so far, and this is an unfair journey because all of you around this table has been on this agenda for many, many years, but this is the short term journey. We started in September, 2020 with a workshop on access to insulin, exactly because it's hundred years and so far no insulin had gone through pre-qualification. So we really wanted to address what's happening. Then we had stakeholder consultations. We had recommendations from the Lancet Commission expert consultation. We had the global hearts looking into this because of the strong association with cardiovascular disease. We had an informal consultation with people living with diabetes, and that was really a game changer for us. And we had a dialogue with the pharmaceutical industry on insulin and devices, and we're discussing 31 asks from the WHO, and I think we see progress today. And then we did the Global Diabetes Summit. Next slide, please. So more importantly now is to look ahead. So, of course, the diabetes resolution is what we will be acting on from WHO. We are also very lucky to have the ability to establish a strategic advisory group on NCD, but also a technical advisory group on diabetes. And we hope to be able to convene the first meeting already this summer. So we have established a work plan with six work streams. I will come a little bit back to that. But of course, one of the major things we are working on now is recommendations and the targets. And we need to uh, establish uh, this and deliver a paper to uh, WHO and governing bodies uh, this autumn to be uh, discussed already in the EB next year. We also have a paper looking into concrete guidance and pathways to implement NCD in general, and this work will also feed very well into that. We are going to look into regulations, transparency, but also very importantly to look into how we can improve the situation for people living with diabetes during humanitarian emergencies. As you know, more people get their legs amputated because of lack of insulin than landmines in humanitarian settings. Next slide, please. So the world we want is of course that we want to see priority given both to prevention diagnosis, controlling diabetes, and also risk factors, including obesity, which is a major risk factor in primary healthcare and in the UHC. And this should also be seen as part of the preparedness. Like Peter said, we saw that people living with diabetes and other NCDs were the one, especially at the risk of dying during COVID. We need the co coverage targets. We want to imitate the success from HIV and also cervical cancer. And of course, there is a lot to do on regulatory requirements to harmonize insulin and other insulin medicines and health products. And it was very important for us that we had the full support from member states on transparency of markets for insulin and other diabetes medicines and health products. Next slide, please. So I will not go through all of this. I just want you to know that the assignments given to WHO is very clear and we have a lot to do, but we cannot do this alone. So of course you will be all invited into the process in different way. We will have web-based consultations on the recommendations, the targets both for obesity and for diabetes. Next slide, please. And you will see technical products coming out. We call them global public health goods. These are things that will help and support the member states to implement. I know it's time up. I have one more slide, Peter. Thank you. Next slide. So this is a summary of the work streams and we have six of them. So access to insulin, technical products that to be produced and that includes also uh, to looking into the gap of uh, the research innovation 
prevention, as I mentioned, but very importantly, country support. And we will already next week uh, have a, uh, what we call a spotlight because we are not empty handed. There is no reason for countries to wait. We have a lot to do on diabetes treatment and prevention, research, innovation and governance. And that's where we will build the partnership. I think we stop there and I hope to come back in any questions or uh, uh, through the chat as well. Thank you very much, Peter. Over to you. Well, thank you, Bente. That was really a wonderful, wonderful introduction, uh, not only for the session, but also for making real progress on people with diabetes. Uh, the number that stuck in my mind was 100 years and 50% access. And uh, I think that's very um, shocking, actually, and something that we can do something about, as you say, together. And also your emphasis on doing that in the context of primary health care and universal health coverage is excellent and many specific areas for action, which we'll turn to now in our panel, uh, which is about bringing the global diabetes compact to life. And I'll introduce the titles of the panelists now and then call upon them one on one for brief introduction, uh, introductory remarks, and then we'll have them uh, in a bit of a discussion and we'll try and keep this moving along. Uh, the panelists that we have, the three panelists, are terrific. They're Dr. Ephantis Murray, who's the head of non-communicable diseases at the Prevention and Control Unit in the Ministry of Health of Kenya. Uh, Ms. Marit Victoria Pedersen, the senior advisor in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for the Government of Norway. And Ms. Camila Silvest, who's the Executive Vice President for Commercial Strategy and Corporate Affairs at Nova Nordisk. And so um, having introduced uh, all three, I want to now call upon Dr. Afantis Mare uh, for uh, your introductory remarks. Dr. Mare, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you. I'm uh, Dr. Afantis Mare from Ministry of Health, Kenya. I head the Department of Non-Communicable Diseases, where diabetes is uh, domiciled. I'm a public health uh, specialist. And uh, today I shall be sharing on uh, what we are doing in, the, in our country, Kenya, to make sure that uh, we increase uh, capacity to screening, diagnosis and management of diabetes in our country. So I'll uh, take a very short time to do this. I shall also maybe highlight on uh, the, the systems we have uh, developed in our country uh, in order to, to strengthen our health system in our country so that they can be responsive to uh, issues of diabetes in, uh, in Kenya. Number one, I would really want to, to say that uh, in our country, we are experiencing what we call a, a, a shift, a paradigm shift from uh, communicable to non-communicable diseases. And uh, diabetes per se is on the increase. And therefore, that being the case, Ministry of Health has put uh, up uh, very elaborate measures to make sure that uh, issues of diabetes are well uh, addressed. To start with, uh, we, as a country, we have developed a, a non-communicable disease strategic plan, which runs from uh, 2021 to 2026. And it is in this plan, uh, we have also clearly elaborated on how we shall uh, uh, strength and health system to handle non-communicable diseases, including diabetes. Of importance to note is that uh, we have also, as a country, developed uh, national guidelines for management of uh, diabetes. Uh, not also to forget that uh, we have also put, uh, uh, we have also done a lot of uh, work in trying to integrate uh, management of diabetes in other national programs. And uh, in, this, uh, in this sphere, we are really working very closely with the National AIDS Control Council uh, to make sure that we, we are able to increase uh, awareness of diabetes screening and the management. Also, we have done this with uh, our national TB program. And through this, uh, we are able even to improve on uh, what we call uh, registry of our diabetes patient. Also to mention is that uh, we, 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 have, we are working with quite a number of strategic partners uh, in the management of diabetes. 
And these partners are involved in uh, a num various activities ranging from uh, awareness creation, screening, diagnosis, and uh, management. And uh, of course, a number of them are also involved in making sure that access to supply chain for management of uh, diabetes is uh, maintained and uh, our clients are able to access insulin and other non-injectables uh, for management of insulin uh, of uh, diabetes with ease. Of uh, importance to mention is that we are working very closely with the Novo Nordisk Foundation, organizations like PATH, uh, MSF, uh, Medtronic Labs, among others. And uh, similarly, uh, in our ministry, we have embraced uh, uh, management of uh, diabetes at the primary health care, whereby, particularly for screening, we are using community-owned resource persons. And in our country, we call, we call them uh, community health volunteers, whereby we are able to provide them with uh, screening, uh, screening machines and therefore, after maybe creation of awareness, they are able to reach the community at the very low, lowest level. They are able to screen them and link them for care at that lowest level. And uh, of course, establish a very elaborate uh, referral system, starting from the community to level one uh, service, uh, level of service uh, offering up to the highest level. So we have uh, developed that very, very, very elaborate network and of course not forgetting that uh, we have also embarked on uh, training our health workers because this is a gap we realized on uh, uh, management of diabetes we have uh, in the whole country we have uh, trained uh, about uh, 1000 uh, healthcare providers on uh, management of diabetes it is important to note that uh, health services in our country we, we have a devolved system of governance. And therefore, we have made sure that uh, in each and every, and the devolved uh, unit is called the county. We have made sure that each and every county has a, 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 a good uh, number of healthcare providers who can comprehensively handle diabetes and mentor other healthcare providers. Notwithstanding, we have also trained quite a number of uh, TOTs and Apart from uh, training a number of TOTs, we have also incorporated uh, management of diabetes in our tertiary institution uh, training curriculums. And as we talk today, all our tertiary training uh, institution uh, have curriculum on uh, management of diabetes among those various things we have done. I wish to stop at that, maybe because of time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Fantas Murray, for that uh, very, very good summary of uh, diabetes care. And now I'd like to turn to Ms. Marit Victoria Peterson from the government of Norway. Uh, Ms. Peterson, you have the floor. Please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Peter. Um, and first, um, thank you for inviting me to speak at this event uh, on such an important topic. And I really like the title of the webinar, Uniting for Action. I really I certainly hope that we can do that. So I will start with a, a broader approach and talk a bit about uh, the NCDs. Uh, and as we've heard, uh, the number of deaths from NCDs has increased dramatically over the past decades. Uh, and the proportion of premature NCD deaths is highest in low and middle income countries. And this is also where we see the fastest rate of increase in mortality. So the health systems in many of these countries are not prepared for the enormous and growing NCD burden. Even so, work to tackle NCDs only get about 2% of the total global health-related development funding. So these facts led the, the government of Norway to develop a strategy uh, on combating NCDs as a part of our development policy, and this was launched in November 2019. And WHO uh, is our main partner in the follow-up. Uh, we support their NCD work uh, quite broadly across departments and units. And recently signed an agreement also with the NCD Alliance, since collaboration with civil society is very important for us and also good for achieving uh, uh, good results. 
So our NCD strategy uh, does not have a strong focus on the specific diseases. It's rather on action to strengthen primary health care, integrating prevention, diagnosis and treatment of uh, all NCDs. And then, of course, depending on the country's NCD challenges and national priorities. Uh, and then also on the risk factors. But however, we realize that many developing countries need assistance to tackle the strong growth in diabetes. Uh, so this is also among the priorities within the health system strengthening part. We certainly see the need to put this issue higher on the international health agenda and to make sure that all people in all countries have access to affordable insulin. But it's not only about access to insulin, we have to strengthen prevention, screening, early diagnosis and appropriate diabetes care, uh, care as we've heard. So NOE was a co-sponsor of the resolution on diabetes at the World Health Assembly. And we believe that the resolution was a great achievement since we know uh, that large scale global efforts to combat diabetes as well as the other entities could save millions of lives, contribute to healthy populations and economic growth. And this is crucial for achieving the uh, sustainable development goals. And we strongly support a global price reporting mechanism for insulin. There's clearly a need for more transparency. Such a mechanism would hopefully contribute to bringing the prices down, because the high prices of insulin today is one of the main reasons for the high death toll. In Norway, people with diabetes can live well with their disease since they have access to affordable insulin. This may not be the case for a poor family in Malawi, having a child with diabetes type 1 and not being able to provide life-saving insulin. Norway strongly supports global diabetes targets, uh, the same uh, way as we have global goals for several of the communicable diseases. We should have global goals for diabetes. Such targets would hopefully translate into deliberate action in countries to prevent diabetes type 2 and prevent deaths from diabetes type 1. We are pleased that WHO recently launched the Global Diabetes Compact, uh, which will, will facilitate cooperation with the pharma industry, with donor uh, countries and societies and people living with uh, diabetes. This will help find solutions and concrete actions so that people uh, survive diabetes, not only in Norway and other high income countries, but all over the world. It is time we get there. The Prime Minister of Norway took part in the launch of the compact, which underlines the importance of this issue for Norway. So finally, we urge all countries to step up action on NCDs, and we urge other donors to join us in supporting developing countries in fighting NCDs. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Pedersen. That was terrific. And now I'd like to turn to Ms. Camilla Silvest uh, from Novo Nordisk for your remarks. You have the floor, please, Ms. Silvest. Fire away. Thank you very much. And thanks for inviting me to be part of uh, this dialogue. I would like to uh, congratulate uh, Dr. Mikkelsen and her team for uh, achieving the, the passing of the diabetes resolution. Uh, we at Novo Nordis find that that's a very important uh, step forward and a great progress to make sure that we can truly address diabetes um, in many parts of the world. So thanks a lot and congratulations on that. Um, we talked a lot about barriers already. There are so many barriers to break down to truly defeat diabetes. And we would, of course, welcome to be part of addressing those. Uh, there are barriers in the patient access, as we just discussed. There's also barriers in the healthcare infrastructure. And there are barriers that are uh, going beyond that and beyond countries. And so we very much would like the private sector to contribute to breaking down these barriers. And of course, also, uh, I was very happy to hear that governments will also take a leading role, as we just heard from both Kenya and from Norway. So congratulations on that. Um, more back to our contribution uh, in, from the private sector and what we can do to help address uh, diabetes. I uh, would like to explain a little bit about how we think about that at Novo Nordisk. So we very much want to make sure that we have a sustainable business going forward that can address the needs of people living with diabetes and of course also the needs of societies. So to do that, we have defined a new social responsibility strategy that focus of course on innovation because that's our core contribution to society, but it also focuses on prevention and on access to care. And I'd like to give you a few examples of what that entails, especially on the access to care. Um, because we all know that uh, the access to the right infrastructure is important, but also access to low cost insulins is, of course, important. And uh, we, as a part of our social responsibility strategy, made sure 
that we will make sure that vulnerable patients in every country will have an option to get access to human insulins uh, in markets. And we will make sure that that will also be the case in the years to come, uh, even in smaller countries uh, and also in places where maybe the infrastructure is, um, is very low, we will still support also the building of infrastructure. So a few examples. Uh, and last year, we, as part of our access to insulin commitment, reduced the price of uh, one insulin uh, vial from uh, four to three dollars, US dollars. That means it, the price is approximately uh, three cents per day to governments in 76 low and middle income countries. Uh, and also, of course, to humanitarian organizations. But also, uh, as of the 1st of May this year, we have reduced our ceiling price for human insulin to uh, humanitarian organizations and also to the United Nations to $2 per vial uh, so that insulin should be even more accessible to those organizations and all the important work that they also do. Uh, I also wanted to underline again that the uh, removal of barriers in terms of infrastructure building and capacity building is extremely important for us. And uh, I think my colleague, uh, Mr. Leitfinger from the World Diabetes Foundation will also talk a little bit to that and how we are working on that uh, later in this program. Another item that we're working on in Novo Nordisk is to make sure that human insulin can be um, addressed with a better thermal solution. That means that the storage conditions that we used to see with human insulins, we're trying to work to break those down and working on regulatory solutions to make sure that people in low and middle income countries can get access to insulin and store it outside uh, the fridge uh, for a longer period of time than it has been possible up, up till now. We know that that will also be uh, one part of breaking down the barriers to access to insulin so we're working on uh, label updates in, um, on our insulins to make sure that this can become available. And we very much appreciate the WHO and their uh, pre-qualification program to address this. And then finally, I just want to say also that uh, as part of our um, expanding access to care, we are also working to make sure that uh, children with the need of insulin can get access to that. So trying to improve that from 25,000 children in low and middle income countries to closer to 100,000 children with, uh, with the need of insulin. So hopefully all of these um, initiatives can be a small contribution, but hopefully an important contribution from Novo Nordisk in our united efforts to, uh, to truly defeat diabetes. Thank you very much. Well, thank you so much, uh, Camilla, and also to Marit and Afantis. And we'll now have a panel with the three of you and uh, maybe Bente will chip in. We do have a very short time for the panel. So what I wanna do is have a very, very focused uh, question to you. The question um, that you were asked before was actually about collaboration across sectors, but given uh, uh, my friend and colleague Bente's presentation, I also wanna see if there was one thing you would do to improve that situation of 100 years, 50% access, what would that one thing be? It pushes us a little bit from the process of collaboration to the issue of outcomes. So if you want to just talk about collaboration, feel free, because that was the question that was asked. But if I can push you to go to the, the one thing you would do to help improve outcomes, namely outcomes in terms of access, that would be terrific as well. So uh, with that, why don't we go in, uh, in reverse order, but I'll ask you to be very, very brief, maybe 30 seconds, 60 seconds, because we're short of time. So Camilla, if I could start by asking you, what one thing would you do to improve access? You described a few things already, or if you want to answer the collaboration question, please go ahead. Camilla, over to you. Yes, I think I can combine the two in one actually, because right. in terms of collaboration, we would like to make sure that we can also apply more digital solutions to support the healthcare capacity. Uh, the access to good treatment, it builds on healthcare per capacity. And I think digitalization can potentially help us more in the future than what we've seen in the past. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. And uh, uh, Marit, same question to you, please. Uh, yeah, thank you, Peter. Um, on access, I actually am quite happy with the uh, the, the WHA uh, resolution and, and this point on the uh, price reporting mechanism. And it will probably take some time because WHO should come back on this next year. But, but I think this this will help. So, so 
to, to lower the prices. I, I think that's a, a key thing. And then on collaboration, I think of course that's across sectors. Um, I guess that's mainly for the type two diabetes and there's a lot we can do. Uh, and I think we should start really uh, talking to, to other partners, other sectors outside of the health sector. Otherwise we, we won't uh, be able to solve the NCD problem or the diabetes problem. So it's about urban planning, it's about food, the food industry um, and, and also physical activity to plan cities, for instance, so that it's possible to, to, to do more physical activity. And then of course food uh, because of the uh, that risk factor of the unhealthy diets. Yeah, thanks. Excellent. Thank you so much, Marit. And Afantis, same question to you. If there was one thing you would do to improve access from that 100 years, 50% situation, what would it be? And, and also, what collaboration would you like, please? Thank you very much. Uh, taking into consideration, uh, Kenya is uh, a low mid income country. And uh, also considering the rising burden of diabetes in uh, my country, the first thing I would do is that I would want to strengthen uh, collaborations between uh, partners so that uh, we can improve access to uh, supply chain, more so insulin and uh, associated uh, logistics uh, at the facility level. Then number two, I would love to uh, improve or to scale up primary health activities uh, to make sure that uh, we, we, we really increase the public awareness in terms of a healthy diet and physical activity because uh, unhealthy diet and inactivity, these are precursors of uh, uh, diabetes. And therefore, I would mainly uh, emphasize on, on those two if I were to be asked exactly what I would want to be done in Kenya. Thank you. Well, those were terrific answers. Thank you to all three of you uh, in terms of primary health care, diet and physical activity, digitization, more collaboration, pricing issues uh, for products, and other things that you mentioned. So that was really terrific. I just want to ask Bente if there's anything you want to reflect upon. And in particular, there's a few questions in the chat for you. We maybe deal with them as we as we go. One about the AU, one about targets and member states, one about uh, countries with uh, poor infrastructure. If you could give us a quick response, we'll make sure we're um, keeping up and we'll have all our panelists back uh, after the next round of panelists as well. Bente, anything you want to say to keep us going on the, on the yes. Q&A? Yeah, f first of all, you know, this is really about uh, defining uh, treatment and care for diabetes, diabetes patients as part of the universal health coverage. So this needs to be seen as essential health services. So I think we need to realize we need to work on two fronts. So first of all, we need to make insulin more accessible. And that uh, there are many different ways, but we have set up a pre-qualification uh, mechanism. This will help. Uh, we are now working with partners to look into pool procurement. And there are development agencies like NORAD and others that are willing to support these kind of mechanisms as well, because they are needed for diabetes, but also for other NCDs. And then the price transparency. Somebody also talked about forecasting supply chain. All of this has to come together. So I think we have a very clear view. And we need to go into each and one of these things, but I would like us to be, um, let's say, more focused. I think what we tend to do sometimes is we deviate from the things we actually can do to discuss something uh, that somebody else can do. So I think if everybody do what they actually can do, then suddenly we have a very different situation. There is one thing in the chat here, uh, and that is, um, I would like to know how we engage countries. And uh, that is uh, everything we do in WHO now. Dr. Tedros is uh, reminding us every day that whatever we do, it has to have impact. So we work on the three levels and we work through the planning mechanisms. We work with funders who are interested in funding also integrated support to countries that combine prevention and control and access to medicines. So this is uh, some of the things we do. And we help countries and support them in the way they need epidemiologically through the access supply chain or in other ways. So that's a very quick answer. Great. I think I don't want to take more time because I see you are, uh, it's a lot of other people that can speak here. But if everybody do what they can, 
what they can, then it, it's already a good step forward. Thank you, Bente. And I'll ask you and all our panelists to also respond to the specific questions in the Q&A. Um, I'm going to bring Fantus and Marit and Camilla back as soon as we hear from our other panelists, but I'd want to take one second to see if there's a burning point that either of the three of you want to make, because I did make that uh, chat a little bit uh, shorter to keep us on time. Fantus or Marit or Camilla, you had terrific responses. Um, is there any one key burning point you want to make now in 15 seconds before we turn to uh, our next round of uh, our next round of speakers? Marit says Thank no. You. Yes, this is Dr. Ifantos Mare. Maybe I want to make one comment. Please go uh, ahead, uh, Dr. Ifantos. Thank you very much. Uh, for one, as we increase uh, the prioritization and visibility of diabetes and also access to insulin, one thing I would want to mention is that uh, uh, in, the, in the area of collaborations, I've seen a number of collaborators coming to us as a minister and asking us, where do you want us to, uh, us to collaborate with you? Have you costed in that? So in the world of uh, management of diabetes, one area where we are not doing very well and I want to believe this could be the scenario in many countries in Africa, is costing of our interventions. We really need to cost our interventions such that when we are approaching collaborators, we are approaching them with the concrete solution that this is what I want to be done and it will cost this. I think that is very important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Afantis. And I also thank you for focusing on the challenges, especially in countries, because that's what we have to work together to address. What I'd like to do now is hear from the next uh, four um, uh, speakers quickly, and then we'll bring everybody back for a panel. And by the way, just a heads up, I'm going to ask the same question uh, to the other speakers, which one thing would you do? Uh, and then we'll bring everybody back. So don't worry, you'll hear from Fantas and Marit and Camilla again and Bente in a second. So with that, um, let me ask uh, Ms. Nupur Lalavani, uh, who's a lived experience advocate and founder of uh, the Blue Circle Diabetes Foundation in India to give us her uh, uh, brief remarks. And it's so important to hear from uh, uh, people with lived, lived experience. So uh, Nupur Lalavani, you have the floor over to you. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Dr. Singer. It's an honor to be here today and um, to represent the voices of people living with diabetes. Over the next four minutes, I'm going to quickly share some examples of advocacy that have impacted the diabetes agenda in my country, in India. And I'll also share a few learnings that can be extracted um, to inspire other patient advocates in support of the Global Diabetes Compact, which I had the good fortune of attending and co-hosting. Um, it's very important to meaningfully engage with and involve people living with diabetes in all aspects of decision making, which impact them. And that's what the Global Diabetes Compact has begun to do. It's essential to amplify voices so that national and regional level decision makers and stakeholders are able to understand the actual impact on the ground. I'd like to make a case in point here. Um, in India, our government does not prioritize people living with diabetes to get vaccinated first um, against the COVID-19 virus, um, unlike most um, other, de other developed countries. Um, our NGO, Blue Circle Diabetes Foundation, reached out to the local uh, state government here to consider prioritizing people living with diabetes in the vaccination drive and this is all the more relevant uh, because of the vaccine shortage that we have been facing and the fact that people living with diabetes are more likely to have worse outcomes if they, if they contract COVID. Two of our community members who um, live with type 1 diabetes, they lost their lives because of COVID um, and they were not vaccinated. Let that sink in for a moment. Two lives were lost for nothing simply because they were people with diabetes and they could not get vaccinated. The lack of vaccine prioritization um, of people living with diabetes makes a strong case to leverage the power of community and to have a stronger voice together with a unified narrative that calls for immediate and bold action because we are not waiting anymore. Now more than ever, we realize that health is political. It is our role as civil society 
to influence policy change, to sharpen the interconnectedness of stakeholder groups, to connect the dots, to ensure that we leave no one behind. And here's where the Global Diabetes Compact through its multi-stakeholder setup is really well positioned to address barriers to access of life-saving med medicines like insulin and tools like glucometers. One of the learnings from the Global Diabetes Compact is to have a more um, holistic and comprehensive approach towards NCDs, especially diabetes, as we move together to achieve targets of um, the WHO Global NCD Action Plan by 2030, targets to achieve SG, SGD 3.4, uh, which is to re reduce the premature mortality due to NCDs by a third. And like Dr. Mickelson mentioned a while ago, um, SDG 3.8, which is to ensure universal health coverage for everyone. This is especially important to reiterate given that insulin, oral medication, and glucose monitoring tools are life-saving, are essential, and often inaccessible tools, especially in low- and middle-income countries. I very quickly want to share some findings from the Healthy India Alliance's uh, situational analysis report in the context of the top three challenges faced by people living with diabetes. The first one is the financial burden or the lack of universal health coverage. The second is workplace policies that don't allow for time off for healthcare. And finally, uh, very relevant in the context, um, especially of the Global South, societal stigma and the lack of mental health support uh, with respect to living with a chronic physical condition. In the light of COVID, um, we started a free and multilingual diabetes and mental health helpline and um, the helpline is run by trained volunteers living with diabetes themselves. And with that, um, I think um, I've made all my points. Over to you, Dr. Singer, thank you. Well, Nupur, thank you for those excellent remarks and particularly those three points you made at the end are really, I think, very, very important. Your top point was financial, which correlates with the earlier point about costing from Aphantis and of pricing that came up. Uh, earlier as well and you raised. That's a very important perspective. And your second point about time off is also obviously an economic one related to equity, related to social determinants. And so thank you so much. And with that, and we'll bring Nupur back later uh, for more of her perspective. And with that, I want to turn to Mr. Leifanger Jensen or Jensen, the Managing Director of the World Diabetes Foundation. Uh, Life, you have the floor and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much, Peter. Uh, I would like to, uh, to thank the NCD Alliance for organizing this to, uh, important event today. It's an honor to be part of this uh, panel. 20 years ago, World Diabetes Foundation was established by Novo Nordisk as an independent foundation approved by the Danish government. Since then, the World Diabetes Foundation has been one of the uh, leading funders of projects seeking to improve diabetes care and prevention in low and middle income countries. The Global Diabetes Compass has built a momentum for all of us in the global NCD community which we have been waiting for and hope for. As many have told already, the diabetes burden is rising everywhere. And uh, with the recent World Health Assembly resolution, we can also see the commitment of the governments. The Global Diabetes Compass is, uh, is unique in the way it has been developed. It builds on the existing guidelines, but brings in new focus. It promotes partnerships and investments. It creates new framework for all of us uh, to advance and be part of. We think this is very important. World Diabetes Foundation has already supported the compact through the first stages, and we are encouraged to see it's now launched and is in, in, real, in real life. We all carry a big responsibility to ensure that the compact is translated into results on the ground. How can World Diabetes Foundation contribute to the Global Diabetes Compact? We have built strong partnerships over the 20 years with Ministry of Health and Civil Society in many countries. We have provided more than 200 million US dollars in grants to projects with many different partners and stakeholders. We have visited our partners over and over again to listen, observe, observe and learn. And we have learned a lot over the last two decades. Some of the learnings are, we have learned that progress can take time, but if the ownership uh, of the government and the Ministry of Health is strong, the progress is possible. In countries like Kenya and Tanzania, 
uh, Tanzania, both represented here today at the panel. Uh, we have good examples, but also in many other countries. We have supported the national diabetes and NCD strategy implementation. A second learning is that the civil society must be fully involved to make a national response to a diabetes successful. Some of our strongest and largest projects today are co-implemented by civil society organizations in partnership with governments. A third learning is that we have learned that making structures and services sustainable is a challenge. We have learned that human resources capacity and stable supply of medicines are not easy to establish when it comes to diabetes care, especially at the private level. If we are able to reach the 2030 targets, we must focus our investments on integrated primary care. And the fourth learning is that we have learned that partnership is the only solution. The diabetes burden can never be addressed without more and bigger partnership across sectors and across borders. The Global Diabetes Compact calls for scale up, and we have already started. In the past few years, we have approved much larger grants to countries, especially in Sub-Saharan and the Middle East. Scaling up the key element in our strategy towards 2025 is also technology. Uh, we believe that scaling up diabetes care requires uh, use of digital solutions, health solutions, and we will promote and explore this much uh, more via our Diabetes Compass program. The Global Diabetes Compact gives World Diabetes Foundation uh, a possibility to widen our partnership and seek co investments and convergence. We appeal for others to do the same. For long, the response to diabetes burden has been too fragmented. Over the last uh, 20 years, we have worked hard to be a catalyst to put diabetes on the agenda in the low and middle income countries on the global level. Um, and now we want to do it even more. And we, we look very much to have this in collaboration via the Global Diabetes Compact, which gives us a uniform language. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Life. And now, uh, and those are excellent points and much appreciated. And uh, now I'd like to turn uh, the floor to Dr. Kaushik Ramaya, who's the Honorary General Secretary of the Tanzania Diabetes Association. Dr. Kaushik, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for giving me this opportunity to, to be part of this panel. Uh, Global Diabetes uh, Compact basically, I think, has driven the agenda for diabetes care in the lower and lower middle income countries. And uh, part of the process which we see is a part of partnering with the, uh, the, uh, the NCD access to medications and commodities. What is core is that although you have best policies and best programs in place, at the end of the day, are you able to get access to the commodities and the drugs at the end of the spectrum? And that is what I think the global access to NCD medications, uh, medications and commodities is of, of important. We are looking at two different components on the tools which are going to be in place. One is the uh, NCD commodity forecasting tools. And these forecasting tools are already in, 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 in a trial phase in Kenya in four counties. And within these four counties, what you find that within these components, you are able to actually quantify the drugs you require. You are able to get data analysis. You are able to get all the stakeholders together. And you are able to see that what medications, what commodities are. And this is a multi-stakeholder partnership whereby data quality is looked at, the demographic is looked at, we look at the mobility, we look at the services, and we look at the financial ability of those individuals who are there in the place. And at the same time, you look at the protocols which are in place within the primary care or secondary care. What medications are you going to provide? What steps of medications? And when do you have the referral pathway? Based on that, the local health authorities are able to come up with a forecasting tool they have this forecasting component and this forecasting would be for a year or it could be for the next five years and this forecasting could be on a annual basis it could be changed at the same time you have this what we call as a care pack this care pack is is, is something which is a concept which is being considered as, as as something which you are going to provide so when a person with diabetes comes to the health facility and if he's on insulin if he gets an access to insulin, 
in addition to insulin, is he able to get an access to injections, is he able to get access to syringes, needles, lancets, and the glucose strips. And within this care pack component, which is being actually being, being tested and the concept is being developed, is that the person who comes to this facility would get a care pack which will actually encounter all these other commodities which are there. Because we have seen in a lot of situations whereby you could have free access to insulin, but the strips are not there. If the strips are there, the lancets are not there. And if you have the lancets, then you find that sometimes the syringes to inject yourselves are not there. Or if you are having access to the pens, then you don't get the needles. So with these two major initiatives which we have, uh, you find that with forecasting, having adequate drugs supply, commodity supply at the primary healthcare facility, but at the same time, looking from the patient's perspective or with the person with the disease perspective, whether you can get access to those commodities. And with those two components in, in hand, we feel that with, the, with, with, with access to medications, access to technology, access to good quality care, there'll be a tremendous improvement in penetration within the primary health care. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Kashak. Uh, and also for emphasizing the forecasting, the care pack, and how this all gets integrated into primary health care. Much appreciated. And, and we'll have you and the others back in a second. Uh, but now I'd like to turn to our final uh, panelists, and that's Ms. Kelsey Grodzowski, who's the program manager for global programs at Direct Relief. Kelsey, you have the floor. Thank you. I just want to add what an absolute pleasure it is and privilege to be able to speak with all of you and uh, learn from the variety of perspectives and individuals participating on this webinar. So to start off, uh, for those who are not otherwise familiar with the work of Direct Relief, let me provide a brief overview. The organization is privately funded. It's a non-sectarian nonprofit whose mission is to improve the health and lives of people affected by poverty or emergencies without regard to politics, religion, or ability to pay. So as a support organization, this mission is largely carried out by facilitating the delivery of essential medicines and medical supplies to healthcare professionals in over 100 countries, including all 50 US states where we're based and whose patients are unable to pay or otherwise access these kinds of items. So the organization has a roughly 15,000 square meter state-of-the-art pharmaceutical distribution center in the United States, which also includes a 300 square foot meter refrigerated cold room. That's only one of 665 facilities in the country that is accredit accredited by the National Association of Boards of Pharmacy as a licensed drug distributor and is the only one operated by a global humanitarian aid organization and to handle and donate non-USDA registered medicines and medical supplies, Direct Relief also utilizes global warehousing in several other countries, including Mexico and the Netherlands. Uh, Direct Relief has become one of the world's primary channels for distributing donated charitable medicines, including vaccines and other cold chain medications such as insulin to people who would otherwise not have access. In the United States, Direct Relief is a central conduit for distributing such medications to nonprofit safety net providers, including community health centers. These providers are critical in reaching underserved communities and specifically people of color. Outside of the United States and for diabetes care specifically, Direct Relief has been able to donate almost 850 tons of essential diabetes medication, supplies, and equipment to healthcare providers in over 60 countries over the past several years. So to provide some concrete examples of this type of private sector support that Direct Relief has galvanized for the public's good and for patients living with diabetes specifically, um, the pharmaceutical company Merck Germany has made available and donated almost 10 million doses of its uh, glu glucophage or you know, branded metformin medicine for those with type two diabetes plus over 2.5 million doses of its hypertension medicine Concor, uh, which is a branded form of bisoprolol, as some type two diabetes patients also have hypertension. Another fantastic example um, of private sector support has come from Novo Nordisk, who has also donated 
to date around 1.5 million vials of a variety of insulin products to direct relief to support patients living with diabetes in low-income countries experiencing acute or prolonged humanitarian emergency or crisis situations. Aside from the end-to-end -end delivery of specifically requested essential medicines and supplies, including cold chain medications, Direct Relief also supports its global network of healthcare providers by investing in infrastructure projects, which enable the safe storage of many cold chain pharmaceuticals, including vaccines and insulin. A concrete case study of this uh, type of project is um, Tanzania. Uh, Direct Relief provided one of our local NGO partners um, with the capital they needed to construct a large walk-in cauldron up at the pediatric complex block at the Muhimbili National Hospital in Dar es Salaam, Tanzania. Uh, the NGO works in partnership with the government and other NGOs throughout the country to treat pediatric cancer patients. Prior to the construction of the cold room, they relied on open spots and general pharmacy refrigerators found all over the hospital uh, to store their chemotherapy and supportive therapy medicines that required refrigeration. The cold room now allows them to coordinate their patients tre tre treatments more efficiently and allows them to purchase the refrigerated medicines they need in bulk to bring down their operating costs since all of the treatment they provide for their pediatric cancer patients uh, are free of charge. Um, this type of support Direct Relief has provided in Tanzania is by no means isolated, similar to investments. Uh, we've made similar investments at a range of healthcare facilities in the United States, Puerto Rico, the Baham Bahamas, and Dominican Republic, and we have plans to expand further. And I'll just give this final comment. Um, as the COVID-19 pandemic has shown, the need for investment in uninterrupted cold chain refrigeration and often ultra cold chain freezers are a basic and necessary building block of healthcare infrastructure for the ongoing COVID-19 vaccination campaign. This infrastructure will only continue to grow. Uh, this need for the infrastructure will only continue to grow so that everyone can be vaccinated. But as more vaccines are delivered to more places and infrastructure to distribute vaccines to populations is planned for and put in place at all levels of the healthcare system, there does exist an opportunity to strengthen access to care for those with diabetes who require insulin. More refrigerated, cold, more refrigerated cold storage options in more places can be used for vaccine distribution and storage, um, but it can also be used to store and distribute insulin to those who need it most. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kelsey, for those comments. Now we have just under 15 minutes left for our panel. I'm gonna bring everybody in, but I wanna start with the four panelists we've just uh, heard from and ask actually the same question, which is what one thing would you do uh, to help us go from 150%, 100 years, 50% access to let's say 100 and something years, 101, 102, 105, 109, can't be more than 109 because that's 2030 when the SDGs end, when we should have universal access to health coverage, which includes, of course, diabetes. What one thing would you do to take us from 50% access to 100% access for patients with diabetes? And Nupur, if I may start with you, and this is a quick round, but give us the one thing you would do building on your brilliant remarks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Singer. I think I'd just like to reiterate, um, you know, the important of the importance of access to uh, life-saving medication, and like somebody mentioned in the comments, um, diabetes education and support. Thank you. Amazing. Thank you. And please call me Peter because we need to have uh, uh, all kinds of equality here. So, life. If I could ask you the same question, what one thing would you do? Um, to take us from 50% access to 100% access in as short a time as possible, uh, access to care for people living with diabetes. Um, sorry, Peter, but I have to say two things. Um, one thing is partnerships, extremely important in this field here. And then I think uh, digital health, use the technology much better. Good, that sounds good. Collaboration, partnerships, digital health. Thank you, Life. Uh, uh, Kaushik, if I could ask you that same uh, question, and in particular, how do we get those care packs with the forecasting to everybody with diabetes who needs it, or feel free to say whatever else uh, you want in terms of one thing to get us to 100% access from 50%. I think, I think the most important thing is the, is the policy buy-in, is the government buy-in. I think the government should be on board, and two, there should be a patient empowerment. I think if you have got these two things right, if the patient knows what, what, what they need, what they require, and if they have the demand, that this is what we require. And if there's a conducive policy environment, I think these two will match very well. 
And to ensure that these two match, you need a partnership between the two and there has to be a bridge between the two. So I think it's a policy, positive policy environment together with the patient environment will make it successful. Thank you, Kaushik. And of course, uh, the beginnings of that government buy-in, at least on one of your two points, is this uh, Global Diabetes Compact that we're talking about where yes. every government in the world would have agreed at the World Health Assembly. That's terrific. Thank you. And then Kelsey, same question to you. What one thing would you do to take us from 50% access to 100% access, building on the wonderful comments we've heard from uh, Nupur and Life and Kaushik? Yes, thanks, Peter. I think uh, from the perspective of direct relief, we've really seen cold storage infrastructure limitations is a great barrier to access um, insulin and also other healthcare commodities. So I think that would be one thing that we would like to see addressed um, across all levels of the healthcare system. It's just more cold storage infrastructure capacity, um, sp specifically refrigerated cold storage capacity. Great, thank you. Now I wanna open up the panel and bring back Camilla and Marit and Aventus and Bente again, along with the uh, people you've just heard from. And um, maybe I could start with either Camilla or Marit and then go to the other one. Um, what did you hear in that second panel that maybe surprised you, that you thought is extremely important, that you'd like to emphasize, or any reflections you have at this point that can help us work together to improve access? I don't know, Marit or Camilla, which one of you would like to, whoever unmutes first, yes, that's Marit. Go start. ahead, Marit. <laughs> Thank you. Now, I heard several things um, that I would like to comment on, but I'll be very brief. But, but first of all, I, I think, I mean, as we talk now, I, I really think that we should think about the thousands of children with type 1 diabetes that, is, that are dying in, in the low-income um, countries. And I think maybe that's where we should start. I mean, we have, we have the insulin and they need access. But then uh, a couple of things from the chat and also that were mentioned by Nupu, for instance, on the health financing. Of course, that's a key issue. Uh, and we hope other donors will join us uh, in this fight. And also the private sector financing is very important. And we heard the Nordics, who, which are already contributing uh, on this. And, and then another thing that was said on um, the stigma and then the lack of mental health support for people with these chronic diseases. Uh, I think that's also uh, a major point that we should uh, talk more about. And in our strategy, we also have that as a, a priority, the, the mental health uh, issue, and to have that as a part of the primary healthcare services. And then, as Life said, partnerships is the only solution. And uh, so, from Norway side, we're eager to contribute um, in the work ahead under this the global compact. All right, that was just terrific. Thank you. And also, thank you for reminding me. I want to point out to people that if you want to keep asking questions in your chat, all the ones that have been asked have been answered in the chat. And if any of the speakers or panelists want to bring in any or emphasize any uh, questions there as well. So just to say um, to thank you so much to the audience and that your questions are being engaged and uh, we really appreciate them. And Camilla, over to you, please. Yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, I just wanted to add that um, the partnership part that many of you talked about is extremely important and we are happy to provide insulin at the cheaper prices. You heard me talk about that earlier, how we've lowered the insulin prices, yet it hasn't necessarily in, in all countries led to a greater access to insulin because of infrastructure problems. So that's where what I also heard was that the collaborations to build the infrastructure and make the insulin available both for children, but of course also for adults is very important. And then the whole private-public partnerships that Dr. Kaushik talked about is extremely important because only together we can really succeed. And I think that's why I also want to compliment you on hosting this meeting um, and being so collaborative, everyone in general here, uh, because only together we can solve this. So um, I, I like uh, Bente Mikkelsen's point about everyone can contribute with what they do best. And if we all do that, then I think it can come together in a really nice way. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you so much, uh, Camilla, for those uh, for those uh, remarks. And uh, Ephantis, uh, same question to you. What did you hear from the other panelists that you'd like to emphasize or what point would you like to make at, at this point? Um, the last thing you said was the costing was important. And if you want to build on that, please go ahead or anything else that you heard from others that did come up, for example, in, uh, in uh, Nupur's comments. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't want to, I, I'm not going to add much to the whatever has already been said by the last uh, three speakers, but of course I want to stress uh, 
that uh, the, we need a lot of collaborations in order for us to be able to comprehensively address diabetes and make uh, 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 access to insulin uh, more, more, make insulin more uh, readily available for our client. And let me also take this opportunity. I really want to thank those who have been collaborating with, particularly WDF and Novo Nordisk. I want to stop at that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Afantis. And Bente, I want to give you an opportunity to come in and emphasize anything you've heard that you think is uh, particularly important or any action you'd like to request from anybody as we move from kind of theory yes. to action. I, I, you know, none, none of you have actually mentioned this very strongly now, but uh, what was a big surprise for me when I started to work on this is that it's so little knowledge that uh, diabetes is the only of the NCD that is actually increasing in premature mortality. The numbers of people actually having and getting diabetes was a big surprise to many policymakers. And that is something that is of a great concern because if we want this disease and NCD to be part of universal health coverage, we really need to continue with united voices to tell the stories about single people like you did so beautifully, uh, you know, and also mentioning those dying from COVID, but also really make this voice strong. So I think bringing all of us together with the different capacities is so important. Then I would like to say that, um, you know, and, and I actually want to mention uh, some supporters because without the government of Denmark, who actually gave the first money to strengthen uh, the work in, in countries, then came Norway with the NCD flagship initiative with a full understanding of diabetes, European Commission, Russian Federation with their political capital of leading this. And then WDF, I really want to thank you because you gave us the first seed money to actually make the compact happen. And of course, over and uh, now I, I learned to I learned about uh, you know um, uh, the um, some new players here. And Novo Nordic have been there all the time, especially in the humanitarian phase. And now we learn about new players also that really have different profiles. But let's really do this together. So that's the high level. So, you know, we sometimes think we have told the world enough, but we have not. We need to use the sound scientific proof, the figures, the data, the experiences, and continue to influence and claim that these are uh, decision making points for all of us in all our capacities. So the other things uh, in NCD Alliance has been the platform all the time, I also want to say. Uh, and why don't we you know, give pride to those who contribute? It's not a shame to, uh, to praise people and organizations, I would say. Then, of course, if we go more granular and somebody, many how you have talked about financing, it's very, very much linked to the prevention of NCDs and taxation, but also so domestic financing, international funding, like Marit was talking about. We cannot do this without international funding for a while. And that funding can come from all the different partners, as long as we do it without undue influence, of course. And then I think Kaushik, um, it's not a surprise to me, but thank you for mentioning this. You were talking about bundling. It's not only insulin. Insulin without uh, glucose meters is actually of almost no use. And we have heard horrible stories exactly about that uh, from people living with diabetes where they couldn't measure their own blood, blood glucose. Uh, so that was one thing. The other very heartbreaking thing is, you know, people that rationalize, uh, rationalize uh, insulin and just do half doses and one third doses because they cannot afford. And I think we need to see the whole supply chain to understand these uh, phenomena. So I think we are on the right path. I feel very safe that uh, the priorities we have set together is important. Last comment is we will continue to work together. We will make the partnership uh, very, uh, I hope, vital and, and very powerful. And we will bring you together. We will ask you to bring us together. And we will con we convene both on the expert level, but also use the global uh, hearts partnership as an umbrella to bring all of you together. 
So, um, and, but again, I think if we all do what we can do best, industry with their means, uh, NGO with their means, uh, people living with, uh, with all their means, WHO with other sort of uh, means, I think it's, it's uh, impossible that we are not uh, reaching these targets. So please continue to challenge us, Peter. We need the people like you that are so concrete because that's what it's all about. We need to set targets for the next year, for two years, and for 2030, we actually need to uh, achieve the targets that the world has set. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bente, and thank you for your leadership. Listen, I just want to hear very quickly from Nade Balde, who was with us right at the beginning, because the regional perspectives are so important. And then I want to give the last word to Nupur, because the lived experience is what we should be listening to. But the fact of the matter is, we have about one minute left, so I'm going to ask you both to be short. Nade, please go ahead. Uh, thank you, Dr. Peter. It uh, was a very, very nice meeting. Thank uh, for the organizer. I, want, I just want to insist on the urgent things. Political commitment are great, but uh, now it's time for all actors to act. Especially urgent is to address access to insulin. People with uh, type 1 diabetes need it to survive. It's a humanitarian issue worldwide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Naldi. Anupur, last word to you before I do a 30 second wrap up. Thank you, Peter. I think it's a wonderful time to, um, to be alive. And I used to say that, you know, I'm, I'm glad I'm born um, now and not 100 years um, earlier, but I'm even more happy now because I know that the Global Diabetes Compact is a historic, uh, it's, it's a beginning. It's not just an event. It's, it's a beginning of great things to come. Thank you. Thank you, Nupur. And I do see Kaushik and... Uh, Marit and Camilla have their videos on. So I just want to check in. Is there some burning point you want to make? No, no, no. Oh, uh, Peter, I think uh, uh, Bente has summed, up, summed, up, summed it up very well. I think what we now need to do, we have done enough talking. We need to now act. And we need to act in a positive way in which you make sure that what we are actually aiming for and getting those targets done we need to achieve those. And this need to be achieved with a multi-level partnership, with different partnership, but most important, making sure that the person with diabetes gets access to what he requires. Well, that's excellent. And that's a wonderful way to summarize. And I'll just transition from there, Kaushik, to offer the following very, very brief summary points. Number one is my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Tedros always says, together. We can only do this together. And that theme came out very clearly in this, uh, in this session. And secondly, in an era of SDGs, and hopefully as we get into COVID recovery, and we're not there yet, unfortunately, in most parts of the world, and we're seeing terrible inequities, especially around vaccines, as I mentioned, um, as we get into the COVID recovery back towards the SDGs, this will be important. The outcomes are important. And maybe the best way I can summarize is that uh, diabetes and diabetes care is clearly part of global health. That's not traditionally how we think about global health, but we're wrong about that. It's clearly part of universal health coverage. It's clearly part of primary health care. And it's clear that we have to go from 100 years and 50% access to let's say 109 years, which is 2030 and the SDG agenda and 100% access. So if we got 50% access in 100 years, we need to do the other 50% in nine years or less. And it's the type of partnerships, collaboration, perspectives and ideas of people on this panel that will help propel us there. And that's a huge challenge. And it does need to be embedded in primary health care and universal health coverage. So it's not a siloized uh, approach. So with that, I want to thank all the speakers. Um, excellent uh, collaboration and excellent points. I want to thank all the audience and just to point out that your uh, questions are much appreciated and have been addressed in the chat and in the, in the, in the discussion and the organizers. And with that, I want to say thank you and let's do this together and let's not wait another 100 years for the next 50%. And uh, back to you, uh, Noel, to uh, close this off. Thank you, everyone, very much. Thank you, everyone, for attending. We will now close the webinar. <laughs>